the experience of, of watching that uh, again. Um, how did the idea for Fisher King come about? Oh God, it was a, it was the first screenplay that I had written uh, on my own, and um, uh, it started. It all started with an image. Uh, I was coming out of a movie theater on Third Avenue, and these two men were walking across the street, and uh, one was very handsome. And uh, one was, um, I think, mentally challenged, I wasn't mm -hmm. quite sure. But, and they were talking to each other, just the way they were walking t together towards each other, I just imposed this idea that they, they had this sort of bond, this sort of love for each other. And then um, I did a draft, and um, a, 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 a story about a savant and a, and a philosophical cab driver, and um, was a cynic and all of that stuff. And then um, in the process of that first draft, uh, uh, I had the idea that he takes the savant to Vegas to play cards because he can do that. And I, I didn't know anything about Hollywood. I was, I, I'm a New Yorker and I wrote, I read one day in the newspaper that they were making this movie with Tom Cruise about uh, an idiot, a savant who goes to Vegas with his brother called Rain Man. And I, I couldn't believe the same idea kind of popped out of two different coasts. So I threw it away. And then I wrote a second draft. And then um, over the course of two years, I finally got to. Um, to this, and all I really had was uh, the idea that I wanted to write a story about a very narcissistic man who commits a selfless act by the end of the story. Because the 80s, you're young, but the 80s were uh, really awful. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was an ugly, very cruel, uh, narcissistic period, and it, it, there was something about that I just wanted to get out of my system. Mm. How did, um, how did it come to Terry Gilliam's attention? What, what sort of led to this? Uh, well, it, um, I sold it. Uh, I, I finished it in the middle of the longest writer strike uh, that ever, we've ever, ever had. And uh, nobody was buying. You can't buy or read or sell anything during a writer strike. Uh, everything stops. Mm -hmm. So um, I didn't know what else to do. Uh, my wife had been supporting us for uh, the years that while I was working, while I was writing the script. And it's because of her that I finished it. And. Um, the strike ended, and all of a sudden, this flood of scripts came into Hollywood, and within a, within a, a couple of weeks, it got sold. And uh, an executive, it was sold by Disney, it was all, uh, bought by Disney originally, and um, he said something interesting. He said, you know, it's, it, we, always, we thought that with the writer's strike, your writers would write something that was in your hearts, and something that was personal to you. He said, you can't believe how many scripts we've gotten that are buddy movies, that are cop movies, that are writing for the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the reason the timing just kind of rose to the top, because I could never write this, and I could never pitch this in a million years to describe it. And I didn't write it to be made, I, write it, I wrote it as writing samples so I could get work. Mm -hmm. um, so then it got to Disney, and um, they wanted me to rewrite the whole thing, and, uh, and I, I was just grateful for the work, so I did. The, the whole uh, end of the, the robbery was with roller skates and laser beams and things like that. And, um, the head of the studio said, um, this isn't what we bought, but we'll never make what we bought because Disney didn't believe that they were such a thing as homeless people. So, um, and they didn't want to make movies about homeless people. So um, they put me under contract with Soul Script. Then I went to another uh, studio and sat there for a while. And um, conversely, Terry was coming out of Baron Munchausen, which was um, really is a great movie and was kind of a, a, a devastating blow for him in terms of how it was marketed. And for the first time in his life, he, he got an agent. And the, the agent sent him two scripts, Adam's Family and, and um, my script. And they were both sitting on his kitchen table that night. And he read mine and felt that he had written it as if he had written, written it. And um, he had just worked with Robin in Munchausen. So Robin wanted to work with him again because he said Robin had a small part in much of And um, and the movie got made. That's I mean it's really good. Well, I was I was sitting as I watched it thinking they don't make them like they used to, but they never made them like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to steal a line to paraphrase Ghostbusters. Uh, the the just the, the, the wild tone, the ability to capture New York and, and that very I have the power. Of, and it also falls in line with, it's so interesting that Terry says he felt like he'd written because he loves the line between madness and sanity and madness and romance. Right. Um, I'm, I'm curious how much the script changed when you got your stars. No, the, the, the amazing thing, and this is why since then I get very spoiled, because they treated it, uh, Robin treated it like the Grail. He used to call it that, the Bible, the Grail. So uh, he, he rarely improvised. 
myself and a few times he did. And uh, Jeff has one great improv in there that's a great line. He says, New Yorkers don't look up. That was Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, they treated the script uh, sacrosanct. It was really amazing how, how close to it they, they stuck. Um, and that, that, because Terry comes from Monty Python, and my, Monty Python were all writers. And before Monty Python, the BBC realized how famous they were, they had already gotten famous, so they couldn't control them anymore. So Terry comes from protecting the writing, protecting the script. Um, he also was to blame it if it doesn't work, so it's not my fault if it's in the script. But, um, he, so no, they were very protective of it. It's, it's all there. It was all there. How was your New York shoot? I ask selfishly, my way into this movie was, I first heard about this movie when I was 11 years old, because the mansion is Hunter College Elementary School, uh, where I went to school. So we would look up every day in the courtyard looking for Jeff Bridges and Robert Williams <laughs> and scaling the walls. Um, what was your New York shoot like? Because it's all on location. They're all on location, and it was amazing. Uh, it happened to be a really cold summer, so um, when they're naked in Central Park, it was cold. Uh, we had to take some clothes off. Um, it was just happened to be a really cold summer. Uh, for uh, that school on Madison Avenue, we had to change the traffic to make it sh look like Fifth Avenue. So if you're shooting this way at the, at the school, it looks like it's Fifth Avenue. And then when you turn the camera, we had to go to Fifth Avenue and put the two things together. Um, uh, Central, the Grand Central Station was a pretty awesome experience. We were location scouting. And I had written a scene where uh, I guess it looks like a musical. It, it, this woman that I used to see in Grace Station Station uh, used to sing uh, soul music, and people would stand around her and give money. And I had a character like that, and uh, Jack, the Jeff Bridges character, was going to move towards her, and it was going to be the first inkling that he was feeling like a community. And at the same time, Harry was going to be looking at, at, at Lydia and following her, and there'd be classical music. So Terry, and we're all standing on top of the thing at Grand Central, and we're looking at it, and Terry said, wouldn't it be funny if everybody just peered up and started dancing? Mm. And we went, that would be awesome. And he went, no, 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 no. So I, I don't, I'm not saying that, because we don't, I, 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 this isn't a Terry Gilliam movie. He said, yeah, it is. Yeah, that's why we want to be directed. Because it was the first script he'd ever done that wasn't his. And he felt like he was, he, because of Baron Munchausen, he was trying to do something different. But you can't not stop, you can't stop his imagination. And so the idea of everyone waltzing was was uh, Terry's idea. So stunning sequence. Yeah. How do you do that? How do you make Grand Central waltz? Well, um, my wife was a PA that night. She can explain to you what, you know, New Yorkers don't give a shit if you're making a movie and they think they have to get, especially Grand Central, they just want to get home from work. So we were there from 7 at night until 7 in the morning. And um, we had a thousand extras. And that wasn't enough. So if you notice, when you do the high shot, uh, there still wasn't enough people, so Terry, what Terry did was he flipped the negative. So if you really look at the high shot, there are ghost images, because he doubled the amount of people by, by flipping it on its, you know, oh, wow. um, in order to make it look fuller. But that was an extraordinary, um, and, and we, had, we had the choreographer up on a ladder, and we had the music playing um, in, in, all, in all of Grand Central Station and everybody in there, none in sailor outfits. <laughs> it, was kind of, it was surreal. Oh, um, Jesus, do you remember? Three. So you just had three nights of, of Grand Central. Really pissed yourself. off New York. I'm really angry. <laughs> so all around the frame of that are people just well, doing we had, they had to, you know, we had to, well, you know, you're not shooting the whole night. You have to set up for hours. So we were setting up during rush hour as people were coming home, which was not, they were not happy. So we had to stop them, and then we had to let them go, and stop them, and let them go. And that was really terrible. Oh, no. How about how about the, the Central Park sequences? Where did you film? Where is the whole, the whole this sort of shanty town? Where is that? Name? That's under Manhattan Bridge. Nice. It's like, it's like, yeah, it's Manhattan Bridge. Um, and that's where they get beat up uh, too, because you can see the train. Mm -hmm. He shut down Manhattan Bridge uh, and put lights on, which was, I, it was amazing. I also, I also enjoyed that it's sort of a who's who of character actors. Well, I said to you, there's maybe Dan Futterman trying to sit Rob. Dan Futterman is the guy who beats him up, who then went on to write for Cody, and he wrote the new Ben, ben and Miller movie. Um, he's, uh, yeah, it, it's amazing. Yeah, I saw him in Angels in America, David Hyde Pierce. David Hyde Pierce, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Mercedes Rule won an Academy Award for this. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think so. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. But how did those, how did that character come into your That's my, uh, uh, well, first of all, that, that's, uh, those are my sisters and my mother. Because, uh, <laughs> I'm an Italian-American Brooklyn you know, family. 
Um, <laughs> so literally, it's right out of their mouths. And uh, our first apartment uh, on on Second Avenue, there used to be this independent when we had video video stores, mm. and this woman. Um, I don't think her name was Annette or something. Uh, she had long, long fingernails, and she ran this video store. And I loved her. You know, she took her all of every vacation. She was in Vegas, and uh, she had teased like black hair, and her, you know, and she was about this high. And um, she was Italian. And I just, we became friends because I used to go in there a lot, and I based it on her. Fantastic. I, it made me so nostalgic for video stores. Oh God. <laughs> um, my, my grandfather owned a video store when I was a kid in Puerto Rico, and even I got nostalgic for the fact that the pornos in a separate section, <laughs> which was a law, like it needed to be behind yeah. a curtain in a separate section. Behind me, didn't you? Porno. 